Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Miki Chaimovic. I'm VP Business Development with RSAP Vision, a global leader in computer vision and deep learning. Uh, for this webinar, I'm hosting Moshe Zafran, our VP R&D. Hey, Moshe. Hey, everyone. And we will be discussing how to boost your medical devices and applications with AI. A few words about the RSAP vision. Uh, we are providing AI and deep learning solutions for image analysis. Uh, that's the only deep learning solutions we provide. We don't do genomics or anything like that. Uh, we stick to what we do best. Our solutions add value to the customer's products and services. This is, in fact, uh, what we are going to discuss uh, uh, now. The solution is customized based on your project needs and your data set. Uh, this industry is very far from standardization and you can't really get a standardized product that would fit your exact needs. So what we do is we start with your needs, we have a look at your data set, and then we provide you with the AI solution that is customized to meet those needs. We've been doing that for over 25 years uh, with multiple repeat clients in the USA. We have extensive experience in all AI and deep learning techniques in numerous medical and pharma applications, as well as in uh, other fields. Uh, we have an experienced team of uh, 45 engineers uh, located in Tel Aviv, Silicon Valley, and Boston. Uh, in addition to that, we have a medical team in staff to guide solution development, including radiology, pathology, and more. So the bottom line is the bottom line. Uh, in case you plan to develop an AI solution, RSAP Vision is the safest, most stable way to do it. Uh, we've done dozens of solutions for medical applications along the years. I'm not going to uh, review them all, but as you can see, we've touched uh, all modalities, uh, CT, ultrasound, MRI, X-ray, uh, OCT, uh, pathology, and microscopy. And we've touched pretty much every organ in the body and uh, most types of uh, tissues out there. We're not a research company. Uh, we are... Uh, providing real life, real world solution to people like yourselves who are providing uh, real life products to the market. Uh, but every once in a while, if uh, research centers uh, needs our assistance, then we're happy to cooperate. Let me tell you a little bit about our uh, development uh, process. Uh, since this is not a standardized uh, product, we start with a proof of concept that is aimed at uh, giving you uh, a feeling of what you're gonna get and giving us an opportunity to look at your project, at your data set, and come up with the uh, right understanding as to uh, the effort that will be required. So we start with the, when we sign a mutual NDA, uh, then we define what parameters and deliver are needed from the POC. Uh, these would be a moderate uh, parameter. This, it, this will not be, of course, the, the full uh, solution, but it's enough in order to uh, keep us uh, getting us started. Uh, and, we, and the customer provides a few samples. I know that samples are often a uh, source uh, for worry. Uh, then, so I'll just say you don't need to worry. Okay, uh, for the POC, you don't need to have uh, many samples. Uh, the more, the merrier, of course, but uh, really a handful of samples uh, would do. And then we start the developing the proof of concept. This would take uh, a few weeks uh, usually. And once we have it ready, we present it to you. Uh, we show you the findings. We, we let you feel it. Uh, and you go and get the OK from the people you need uh, uh, to get the OK from. Uh, once we have the green light, uh, we define the fully developed solution. Uh, we develop it, of course, and this is an iterative uh, process, uh, including weekly discussions and updates uh, regarding the solution development. All in all, it takes a few months usually, uh, not too many of those. Uh, so for instance, if you start the process now, by the end of the year, you can have an up and running AI solution integrated into your uh, medical uh, device. Uh, AI can do many things. Uh, many of them uh, fall under the categories of segmentation, classification, and quantification. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with those, but 
just to keep uh, everybody on the same page, I'll uh, uh, tell you a little bit about it. Uh, segmentation basically means that we want to segment the different things that are on the photo, and it can really be everything, okay? Organs, lesions, nodules, tumors. Uh, if we're talking about the pathology, it could be cells and tissues and uh, nuclei and so on and so forth. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the customer also needs classification, uh, so we classify the different things that we've uh, segmented, uh, and oftentimes it, there is also a need for a quantification, which basically means that you put a number on those findings, okay? The number could change. Maybe you're looking for the length, maybe you're looking for the volume, maybe you're looking for density, maybe you just want to know how many of those findings are, are in there, uh, and we can do all of that very very accurately and uh, quickly. Now I'd like to address uh, the benefits of AI, and I'd like to do so uh, using the perspective of the medical uh, device user, uh, namely your uh, customers, uh, the people who are using the medical devices uh, on a daily basis. And those benefits would be uh, saving time, reducing the number of errors, and improving clinical uh, insights. So let's see a few examples uh, to these. Uh, saving time is pretty much straightforward because once during the check, uh, the user gets segmentation, classification, quantification, whatever he needs, uh, it just saves him a lot of time looking for things and doing all these things by himself. For instance, if we look at these uh, CT, uh, DCD uh, photos, then uh, I guess you can see that there's a very small red dot uh, hiding somewhere in there, okay? That would be the, the needle in the haystack, so to speak. And for the user to start looking, reviewing into all these chests in order to find the, this, this little spot uh, is of course something that is very time consuming. But once he has the segmentation in place, then he can see, uh, you can see that to the right, everything that is there, okay? We're mapping those needles for him, okay? And we're classifying it for him, the red ones being tumors, the uh, green ones being uh, nodules, and the blue one is just uh, water in the in the lung, okay? So once he can see that, you know, it's the rest is pretty much straightforward. He can focus on whatever he needs to focus on and save a lot of time. Another benefit uh, would be the potential for reducing number of errors. And I'm saying potential because, you know, theoretically we can say that there were no errors, but in real life, of course, you know, we, we're humans, we make mistakes and that's, that's natural, that's perfectly okay. Uh, our role here is not to replace the user, uh, but rather to help him uh, identify and avoid those uh, errors. And a major error, of, of course, is misdiagnosis. We're just, you know, missing the tumors, okay? So in this CT scan, for instance, uh, you can see or you can hardly see that there's anything there. But again, once the segmentation is in place, then he knows that there is something there. Once he knows that, he can zoom in to that specific spot and analyze it, okay? And then he, he can convey his opinion, he can think about what it means, what it doesn't mean, and so on and so forth. Doing that really helps him find these issues and deal with them and reduce the number of uh, misdiagnoses. Another example is partial diagnosis, okay, missing those secondary tumors. So for instance, if we look at these photos, okay, you can see that the red arrow is emphasizing something very suspicious. Uh, you know, we, we would have been able to notice that. But again, when we look at the segmentation, we see not only the big tumor, but also that there are two nodules hiding in the back somewhere. So again, we will use the segmentation. We will zoom in and really uh, get to know these guys and uh, understand their uh, meaning. So as we said, uh, the potential for reducing errors uh, is very important and it's also very important because it reduces the repercussions of those errors. And those would be, of course, the clinical repercussions, the financial repercussions, and oftentimes also legal repercussions. 
When we're talking about improving clinical and uh, uh, research insights, uh, again, there are zillions of uh, uh, examples. I'll just give you a few of them, okay? And one of them would be accurate measurement. And oftentimes, people need to uh, measure uh, something that they've found, okay? Uh, for instance, for scores that are quite common in this uh, field. And one of them is uh, RESIST, which is used for uh, monitoring the response of malignant tumors. So in this case, for instance, we have segmented the tumor, we have um, classified it as a tumor, and now we can also measure it, okay, its length in this case, uh, which is required for the RESIS score, and find out in no, in no time that this is exactly 62.14 millimeters long. This is a a high value to the user because it gives them the, the accurate uh, uh, answer and it uh, it's doing that automatically. But it's on, not only the things that, that you need for the scores. There are many other things in which quantification can contribute uh, and provide a significant clinical value. And one of them is the volume of the tumor. Again, this is merely an example. There could be others. Uh, but in this case, for instance, uh, there is evidence in research that uh, tumor volume reduction is superior to resist, in fact, for predicting the pathological response uh, of cancer. Okay, now this is this is great news. This is of, of, of high value. But the question is, okay, let's say I'm, I'm the user and I understand that I need to, to measure the volume. How do I do that? Once you have quantification of an, AI, of an AI solution in place, you can do that easily. Okay, and here you can see that one of them is uh, uh, 3,887, uh, 3, the other is uh, 6,275, and so on and so forth. And I'm showing you the photos of these uh, ill-looking uh, creatures uh, because you can really see that they have these strange looks and it's very hard to quantify or even estimate uh, the volume when they look like that. Okay, so again, this is uh, something that is of great uh, clinical value and it's very easy to do with uh, AI. So we've talked about the AI uh, benefits uh, for the user. Uh, we're saving him time, we're reducing the number of errors, and we're improving clinical insights. Uh, these, of course, provide value to the user. And uh, once you provide it to your users uh, via your uh, medical uh, devices, then it puts you in a slightly different position in the market. Another thing that uh, uh, medical pro device providers are often uh, thinking about is the question of the software or hardware, okay? And but most medical devices these days, you know, are mostly hardware. It, it's, it differs sometimes when we speak about uh, medical applications, but still, you know, most of them are hardware. So, you know, that's very natural that they'll focus on the hardware. Uh, but we should keep in mind a few things regarding the software. Uh, one of them is that uh, software uh, often solves problems that cannot be solved with hardware, cannot be solved at all. And many people are knocking on our doors asking for solutions uh, that they cannot solve even if they had uh, a higher resolution or different types of focus or all kinds of things that hardware can provide. So that's one thing. Another thing is that software is oftentimes faster to develop. Okay, not every time, not all the time, not in all cases, but in many cases, it's faster to develop. As I showed you beforehand, uh, it takes a few months, that's it, and you can have an AI solution customized to your needs as an integral part of the medical device that you provide. Another benefit is that it uh, it oftentimes cheaper, both uh, with regards to the basic investment in the R&D, the, the, the engineers, and so on and so forth, and of course, with regards to COGS or BOM, uh, namely the cost of the uh, solution is not uh, increased by the addition of the software. So that was a general uh, explanation about the benefits of AI and the, and the things that you know are worth uh, thinking about uh, when you're uh, a medical uh, device provider. Uh, and firstly, I'll encourage you to send us questions regarding whatever you want, okay? Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of uh, this uh, a webinar uh, in which we'll uh, address those uh, questions. Uh, and secondly, I'll uh, hand it over to, to Moshe uh, to talk to you about a few of our recent applications as well as a case study. Moshe, the floor is yours.
Hi everyone, my name is Moshe. I'm leading the R&D efforts at the uh, RSAP Vision. Um, so as uh, Mickey mentioned uh, earlier in the beginning of his presentation, uh, we actually work in a very wide modality of uh, applications and of modalities. So Mickey presented a sort of a diagnostic application of a cancer quantification. Uh, these are just a few examples of uh, other recent uh, projects that we've done. Uh, so we've done uh, airways and chest CT segmentation uh, for uh, actually for bronchoscopy navigation. This is uh, being used already in a medical device. It's integrated in our uh, customer system. It's being used uh, by their uh, customers. We've done uh, segmentation of retinal layers in optical coherence tomography. Uh, this is for a research uh, application, actually. Uh, brain hemorrhage segmentation. Uh, again, this is uh, uh, used in a, a clinical setting. Uh, interoperative medical device uh, guidance system, including a variety of uh, applications, some of which I'm going to talk about uh, soon. And uh, another uh, recent uh, project that we've done, actually a long-term project that is now in clinical trials, uh, was 3D reconstruction of heart chambers. Again, uh, in, uh, it's being used uh, in clinical trials for uh, a medical device uh, for a catheter uh, ablation procedure. Um, I'd like to go a bit more in depth uh, into uh, one particular case study, uh, which is uh, computer vision uh, modules and algorithms for knee and hip replacement surgery. So uh, a few words about uh, uh, the device and the use case. So uh, uh, the product of our customer is a surgical planning and uh, navigation system that allows preoperative planning using CT for knee and hip replacement surgery, uh, as well as a tool that's used interoperatively for uh, precise, precise uh, cavity preparation. So in the planning, uh, uh, both in the planning and in the interoperative uh, aspects, uh, what we need is a, a precise 3D model of each bone, whether it's in the knee joint or the hip joint. Uh, and this is used to plan the surgery and to actually help a robotic tool uh, cut and prepare the cavity for the, uh, for the uh, implant uh, that's going uh, into the knee. Uh, an alternative application for the same uh, computer vision uh, modules that we are providing is creating patient-specific implants. So if you know the exact shape of, uh, of the joint and each of the bones in the joint, then uh, this can be used to create uh, uh, implants that are actually shaped uh, specifically to fit uh, uh, each uh, individual patient. Uh, the modules that we uh, provided uh, to our customer in this case, uh, again, in order to uh, take their uh, uh, device and their system to the next level, we actually provided two modules. The first one was a bone segmentation module, and the second is a landmark detection module. So uh, the input, as far as the uh, images are concerned, is a CT scan. And uh, in these two slices here on the bottom right of the slide, uh, you can see two different uh, uh, views, <clears throat> two different slices of a 3D CT scan. And of course, what you get is simply the uh, density, the radio density of each voxel, of each uh, 3D location in the world. Uh, and this is not yet a model of the bone itself. This does not give you the shape of the bone. And the purpose uh, of our uh, first module was to generate an output that looks like this. So this is a 3D mesh of each individual bone in the knee joint. And now once we have this, once we have the bone separated from the background and from each other, then we can know uh, what the shape of each uh, uh, part of the cavity is. And then uh, the, this can be used to plan uh, the surgical uh, operation and to guide the cavity uh, preparation and cutting. Uh, in the next slide, we can see an example of a bone segmentation for a hip bone. So here the femur and the pelvis are separated from each other and separated from the rest of the CT. And we have a three-dimensional model that we have generated of each uh, uh, bone in the joint. Okay, so uh, what is the benefit of this module? So uh, before working with uh, us, uh, our, uh, our client uh, obviously still needed this uh, segmentation functionality, but they were doing it uh, manually or almost completely manually. So uh, there were some maybe uh, basic algorithms to get some initial guess, guess and then there was a manual tool uh, that their users were using to get a good uh, segmentation and create a good model uh, of the bones. And this took hours of work on preoperative planning, uh, which is obviously uh, uh, very inefficient and very costly. Uh, after our uh, module was developed and integrated, uh, then this, uh, these hours uh, became minutes, 
And at a later stage of the uh, process, when we uh, upgraded the algorithm to a newer technology, became seconds. And this process became fully automated. So you don't need a technician or a surgeon uh, to play around uh, with some uh, interactive system and to create the model themselves. It's uh, just the click of a button, and uh, in comes the CT, and out come uh, the uh, 3D models that are needed for the uh, uh, planning and the guidance of the operation. So uh, this is obviously a, a very uh, salient benefit uh, for our client and for their users, uh, both saving time and saving uh, work uh, for uh, uh, the people uh, involved. Um, yeah, so a few words uh, about the technologies uh, used for these modules. So uh, segmentation in general and 3D segmentation uh, in particular, there are many uh, technologies out there. Uh, at the first stage, when the data was limited, uh, uh, then uh, we can use uh, what's called classical image processing methods. One way to do it is illustrated uh, in the upper right. So you think of each voxel as a node in a graph, and you have edges connecting these nodes. So uh, uh, voxels, adjacent voxels of similar color will have a strong edge, uh, and uh, voxels of different color, typically near uh, the surface of a bone, will have a weaker edge. And then uh, there are algorithms that can automatically find the optimal way to cut this graph into two subgraphs. So one subgraph, uh, uh, as is seen abstractly here, represents, uh, say, one of the bones, and the other one represents everything else or the background. Uh, and uh, this algorithm, the advantage is that it doesn't need uh, any labeled training data. Uh, however, as I said, it, it uh, takes minutes. Uh, and also, uh, uh, so, so that was the first stage, actually, of the system. They're very happy with it, it was integrated. The second stage, was to use uh, uh, newer uh, technologies called deep learning or neural networks, these are supervised learning-based technologies. Uh, we actually use the first algorithm to create a training data set for the second one, instead of annotating it by hand. Uh, and then uh, after uh, uh, some uh, uh, small uh, uh, sifting and cleaning up of the data, we use that to train a neural network uh, illustrated in the lower right. Uh, you can see the uh, architecture of the network for those of you uh, from the field. Uh, and deep learning, uh, can provide a, but both a much faster solution. These uh, run on GPUs. They're what's called embarrassingly parallel uh, uh, algorithms uh, for each uh, uh, layer in the network. Uh, and they're also more robust. Uh, the percentage of uh, failure cases uh, went down uh, even more. So yeah, so that, that's the first uh, module uh, we provided. Uh, as I said, uh, we are a computer vision company. Uh, we work uh, in all modalities uh, and uh, with all uh, uh, methodologies, and uh, we are not by any means uh, limited uh, to segmentation. Uh, there are many other uh, uh, great uh, functionalities that can be achieved with uh, computer vision and AI. Uh, and in this case, for this device, uh, the next uh, added value that we were able to provide was the landmark detection. So in order to improve the accuracy of the implant placement, it is important uh, for our customer to automatically detect various landmarks uh, on the uh, heads of the bones. Uh, uh, so for the knee, it was uh, specific uh, landmark points that are used uh, uh, to plan uh, the uh, operation and to understand the anatomy. And uh, for the uh, hip replacement, it was the head of the femur that we detect in uh, CT. So uh, as you can see, the, the femoral head was detected directly from CT and on the right-hand side, the landmarks in the knee joint were detected from our bone model uh, that was generated by the previous uh, module. Uh, and uh, these are uh, important both for increasing the accuracy of the system and also for choosing the implant size. So instead of the uh, surgeon just eyeballing it and uh, taking one of the implants of a specific size, uh, you could actually measure uh, the size of the bones and choose uh, uh, the correct uh, 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 implant variant and the correct size in a much more uh, uh, quantitative and scientific manner. Um, in the next slide, uh, we'll see uh, just a bit about uh, these uh, technologies uh, for finding the landmarks. So for uh, a case such as this, as in which uh, uh, the uh, input is a 3D model or a 3D CT, uh, what we did in this case is a, a actually non-rigid registration to an atlas. So you have some template bone or a small set of template bones, and you try to carefully deform that template uh, to match it to the uh, patient model. So in the template, you know where each landmark is. You've marked it, uh, say, uh, 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 manually even, or a radiologist has marked these uh, landmarks, these anatomical landmarks for you. And then you uh, gradually deform the template bone to the patient-specific bone. 
using an optimization procedure. Uh, and there, this is a, a very interesting uh, uh, algorithm, both math mathematically and implementation-wise. Uh, you detect uh, different feature points on each mesh. Uh, it can be used generically, as you can see, to match uh, uh, different types of uh, meshes in different poses. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, uh, do some uh, iterations of matching these descriptors and uh, using some uh, cost function to deform the mesh in a way that it's not going to deform too much, but it's going to improve uh, the matching between the interest points on each mesh. Uh, use a robust uh, loss function to throw out the outliers uh, because there are going to be some uh, uh, outlier points in these uh, uh, feature points that are detected in each mesh. One of the meshes is the template, the other one is the real uh, model of the patient. And after this non rigid registration is performed, you now know where each of the original landmarks is in the new bone, in the patient's uh, anatomy. Uh, landmark detection is actually an uh, important application in uh, many situations. In some situations, we don't have a 3D model. We only have a 2D model, such as x-ray. So uh, on the lower right, you can see an x-ray of the spine. And here in this project, what we did was to detect the landmarks in the uh, vertebra to detect the corners of each vertebra uh, using a different neural network architecture, using a regression network. Uh, in other cases, if the input is only 2D, there are ways to actually reconstruct a 3D model from one uh, 2D uh, 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 viewpoint if you have a, a big training set uh, and you get uh, a, a model that uh, will behave the statistical behaviors of whatever you're trying to reconstruct. If you have enough 2D views, you can actually do the reconstruction and get an accurate model. Uh, that uh, could be used for more navigation type uh, application. Uh, and these are other uh, other technologies that can be used for automated landmark detection uh, that we uh, uh, enjoy working with very much. Um, yeah, so uh, a few words about the challenges in implementing uh, this module. So uh, Miki described uh, our uh, process in the beginning of his talk, uh, how we work with our cl clients. So every client is uh, uh, unique in some way although there are also market, but uh, every uh, situation, uh, we understand it, we develop proof of concept and then go to the uh, full solution. Uh, and uh, there are always challenges, whether it's uh, data collection, getting the right patient co cohorts as far as demographics and pathologies are, data annotation using uh, professional guidance, we can also help with that. Uh, we can uh, create uh, helper algorithms to ex uh, to uh, 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 expedite the data annotation process. And of course, there are always issues, uh, both of technical issues, such as integration of the software, uh, getting things uh, uh, approved, uh, regulatory fashion, uh, validation, statistics on the results, et cetera, and also dealing with running time and efficiency, whether it's by uh, uh, making our code more efficient and doing code optimization, or in the uh, case of neural networks, uh, there are ways to take the neural network uh, and make it smaller. Uh, you develop a, a big neural network architecture, and then you do what's called network compression to make things run uh, more efficiently and sometimes even run on a, a lower end hardware. So, uh, yeah, so just to uh, sort of uh, uh, tap things off, uh, I'd like to say a few words about our contribution to medical applications. Um, so uh, this quote here is from a different project, uh, although the uh, users of the knee and hip replacement are also very happy. Uh, this is uh, this particular quote is from a, a user researching using a, a different module that we developed. Really, our goal is to bring value to our clients, to their users, and to contribute uh, really to uh, to medical devices and to medical procedures. So uh, uh, this is a feedback from a, a, a user. Uh, first of all, my comment is that these guys defied the status quo, so we develop a, a novel solution. Again, I can't tell you exactly what it is, uh, but uh, we are very happy to develop uh, new groundbreaking solutions uh, and not just to make uh, tweaks to the status quo. Uh, it's important for it to, to be intuitive to our user, uh, to try it out on real cases, uh, to understand the workflow of the users, uh, and to uh, give them benefit. In this case, the benefit was, first of all, uh, the speed of the procedure. This is the fastest procedure I've, I've ever done. It saves a lot of time in the OR, which is uh, obviously a very valuable uh, medically, value, valuable to the, uh, the, uh, the device manufacturer and their users. Uh, it can be tailored to the needs of the clinical scenario. And also, uh, as well as speed, uh, this uh, uh, module also provide increased uh, accuracy in cases where a detailed uh, uh, plan 
for the procedure. Thank you for having me involved. Uh, when you know, uh, I uh, personally or one of our team leaders uh, gets a feedback such as this, it's obviously very heartwarming, and we felt feel that uh, uh, our goal has been met, and we're really making uh, the contribution and bringing the value uh, that uh, uh, we strive to bring uh, to our clients and to the uh, community in general. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Moshe, for this talk. It was very interesting, uh, fascinating uh, case study. Um, now we've reached the Q&A session. Okay, guys, so uh, really feel free to uh, share your uh, questions with us. We'll be happy to answer uh, each and every one of them. Um, just uh, le let us know what you want to uh, hear about, and uh, either Moshe or myself uh, will be happy to, to answer any, any question. So let me see what has already been sent to us. Ta -ta -ta. Well, yeah, you know, that, that's something that always comes up uh, regarding the, the, the annotations and the number of samples. Um, Again, I can only, see, uh, only emphasize what I've said uh, beforehand. Uh, the exact uh, and final number of uh, annotations needed is uh, unknown. It, it really depends on the project. It really depends on what you're trying to solve. But uh, it's not as high as you might uh, fear. Let's put it this way. OK. And again, for the POC level, we do not need many samples. OK. So don't let the, the number of samples hold you back from uh, uh, giving us a call and finding out you know, what could be done uh, for your project. Uh, so that would be one thing. Uh, with regards to the annotation, as uh, Moshe uh, explained, uh, we don't need you guys to do all of those annotations by yourselves. Okay, firstly, the number of annotations required is limited. And secondly, we can do that for you, either with our team or and or with uh, um, semi-automatic tools that we're uh, developing for this uh, project. Uh, so I can say that, you know, from our experience, uh, this number of samples and the annotation uh, uh, associated is not as scary as you might think. Uh, again, this is a generalization, of course. Uh, just uh, ping us and find out what uh, what is true in your uh, case. Okay. Um, let's see what else do we have here. Uh, well, people are asking if there is a paper that explains the principles of our work. Uh, Moshe, you're the writing the papers. Uh, what do you say to that? Uh, papers and also uh, patterns that we write for clients in some cases. So, I, will, I can hardly hear you, Moshe. <laughs> yeah, I said in some cases we write papers, in other cases we help our clients uh, uh, write patterns. Uh, they don't always want to publicize uh, things in a paper before they get them protected as far as IP is concerned. Indeed, and I'll add to that that uh, uh, papers are mostly of interest to uh, academic centers, and we work mostly with uh, commercial uh, companies. Uh, so you will find a few uh, papers uh, with uh, our name, with Moshe's name, uh, but uh, the magnitude of most of the of the work is not uh, does not end up uh, being published. Uh, okay, uh, what else are we? being asked um okay that's another recurring question uh regarding the generity of those solutions uh namely uh, uh can i can we use there are a number of questions about it so i'll just you know i'll summarize them can we use one solution for another device uh moshe what do you say to that so uh, for another device, many cases, no. Many cases uh, for each device, uh, there are different uh, needs, there are different applications. Uh, even in the example I talked about, for the same device, two completely different algorithms uh, that are used for two completely different applications. So when it comes to medical devices, uh, there's less uh, reuse of the same algorithms. Uh, of course, there are uh, you know commonalities, uh, even across uh, uh, markets and across uh, device types. Uh, uh, segmentation is a recurring theme, and that uh, does have uh, many commonalities in the algorithms, but uh, uh, there are many other applications uh, that are uh, quite uh, specific to specific devices. Uh, and this is sort of our uh, DNA uh, to develop custom solutions uh, as a company. 
Excellent. Uh, another more focused question in this regard, how generalizable is an algorithm developed on one scanner applicable to others? Do you encounter overfitting? So if it's, you know, uh, if you're talking about one CT scanner uh, versus a, a different CT scanner from a different make, generally the uh, generalization is very good. Uh, if you're going, I don't know, from a regular CT to a cone beam CT, and all of a sudden there's a lot more noise, then yes, we need uh, samples, whose, uh, at least a few examples, uh, to see what the uh, noise properties are of the new device. Uh, sometimes we can uh, uh, augment that and artificially generate uh, more samples. Um, so we don't always need a full-flown uh, data set from each uh, device, but we do need examples, especially if different devices uh, behave visually uh, different, that uh, if you and I would look at the image, we'd say, hey, these images look different, they have different properties and different qualities, then we'll need the examples in order to uh, develop the algorithm. If it's just, you know, some more uh, fine grain things, some more details that visually uh, you don't think they make much of a difference, then uh, uh, no, we're not going to be overfitted uh, to whatever uh, a very specific uh, device we're developing for. Uh, we take that into account and, you know, there are uh, uh, best practices for avoiding overfitting uh, given a data set with uh, uh, some uh, uh, set of properties. Excellent. Thank you, Moshe. Uh, another question: uh, Which uh, neural network architecture usually use uh, you usually use in a deep learning model, or do you, or have you designed your own architecture? Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't say we we design our own architectures from scratch in most cases. Uh, maybe there are some projects that we did that needed to run on a very uh, uh, low computing power device, and then we built like a small neural network. So I guess you can say uh, that was our own architecture, but it was the main focus was to make the neural network smaller. In general, uh, you know, uh, as the cliche goes, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So I showed you the unit and uh, what we're doing uh, uh, in segmentation isn't exactly the unit. It's, uh, it's a bit different, but it's uh, uh, based on, you know, uh, the literature and the best practices uh, from the field. So generally we take a, uh, 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 well-known or I'd say well-verified uh, uh, networks, things that we know are, are effect, have been effective uh, in similar situations, and then we adapt the full solution uh, to the particular uh, situation. Uh, and that's not only going to be playing with the architecture and training procedures, etc., uh, because it's not only going to be just a neural network, uh, it can be some combination of deep learning and other methods as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question regarding the hardware. Do I need to uh, have a, a, a strong, you know, powerful piece of uh, hardware in order to implement uh, AI solutions? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, maybe we need a uh, powerful hardware or, or access to a few uh, good servers in order to train up the models. But the model that you're going to be used uh, in your uh, uh, solution or in your device generally can run uh, so if it's a neural network, it will run on a consumer grade uh, GPU. And uh, again, we could do network compression and, and bring that down even more if you need. If it's a non-deep learning classical solution, uh, we usually target like standard PC level hardware. So, uh, and we can go uh, lower than that as well. So shouldn't need anything uh, uh, crazy expensive uh, to, to do it. The exact configuration and requirements of course will uh, depend on exact uh, application. Excellent. Uh, another question. Uh, can you combine between an in-house AI solution to RSIP uh, solution? Mm -hmm. So I guess in, in some cases we even help uh, our client uh, uh, guide their uh, uh, in-house AI team and we work uh, together with them. Um, yeah, in other cases, you know, the client has some uh, uh, algorithm or some uh, software or some solution, and then we uh, define together to chop off some specific piece of the work and define uh, uh, some uh, module of ours that will be integrated into the full uh, algorithm, full software that the client is developing, and we uh, take uh, active part in that integration, defining the interfaces. See it as our responsibility that uh, uh, our products uh, 
uh, will be successfully integrated by our client into, uh, into their device or their uh, software. Okay, uh, another question that's again a recurring question is about the FDA. Uh, so I can say that uh, our solutions uh, do not uh, require an, a special FDA approval. Okay, uh, it's integrated into the uh, medical uh, device, uh, medical application, and it gets an approval as part of the entire uh, medical device. And uh, this has uh, happened uh, many times. Uh, this is not uh, a source uh, for worry. Uh, another question. Let me see. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. Well, the, there is the, the recurring question about the price and the cost. And again, uh, you know, there, there is no one answer to that. It really all depends on, on your project uh, needs and then on the effort uh, needed uh, on our behalf in order to provide you with uh, the AI solution that you need. Uh, I'll just say that uh, many times when I speak to people, they say, okay, it's an AI solution. It's customized. You know, it's going to be in the billions or millions at least. And, and and that is really not the case. Uh, it, we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of dollars. We're talking about you know two hundred thousand uh, dollars. These are the numbers that uh, you can think about. And again, it really, really changes. I'm just throwing in these numbers in order to tell you that it's not uh, millions of dollars. Uh, and again, the best answer would be just to give us a call and, and find out yourselves if you have the budget, you have it. If you don't, uh, now uh, nothing was lost. Um, so uh, keep, please keep these things in mind. Um, another question, what uh, GPUs do you use for training? Uh, Moshe, do you have a, a direction? Um, I'd say uh, multiple uh, uh, strong uh, consumer grade GPUs. Okay. Uh, we, we try to select sort of what's the most uh, cost effective. You know, I understand. So the, the, there is no need for, for anything uh, hyper uh, specific. Yeah. So usually, I mean, we, we usually also provide a source code for retraining models and many of our clients uh, like to do that. Uh, and then we can tell them, you know, what hardware we're using to train it. Uh, but uh, for the initial solution, usually we're the ones doing the training and we have the uh, hardware in-house. But again, the, the consumer grade are actually the most uh, high-end consumer grade are usually the most cost effective. Okay. Uh, another uh, <clears throat> another question regarding the time, uh, the timetable. That's a very good question. I, I tried to touch upon that uh, earlier. Uh, maybe you've missed that part of the of the talk, uh, which is of course fine. Uh, so I'll just say that uh, it really depends on the on the project, okay? And it really depends on uh, how cooperative the, the customer is. Uh, we uh, like working uh, as quickly as possible and we're working uh, together with you. So, you know, we're coming up with something, we show it to you and the more available you are to, to comment and to give us feedback, the better and uh, it is and the shorter the overall uh, 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 time span will be. Uh, as a rule of thumb, I would say a few months. Uh, we do have customers who uh, have been working with us for years, uh, but that's pretty much because they started with something, you know, they wanted something, it took a few months, we delivered it, they were happy, and then they came uh, with stage two and stage three, and some of them even stage six and seven, and all kinds of new applications that they uh, thought about. So, you know, we do have long uh, relationships uh, with people, but if you're just worried about, you know, this particular uh, project, uh, if, if it's your first First time it's a start you need something quickly uh, then uh, as I said beforehand by the end of this uh, business year you can have something uh, up and running as part of your uh, medical uh, device and bring something new to the market uh, months is the you know the best estimation I can uh, I can give um, let's see another one. Oh, one second how do you obtain your data uh, only from customers or medical databases? Do you develop in CUDA directly or utilize TensorFlow or, or such frameworks? 
So uh, I'll, just, I'll just answer regarding the data. The best thing is that you provide us with the data because you know you know best uh, uh, your medical device and the data it uh, yields. Uh, if for some reason you're just starting or something like that and you don't have the same uh, data set that you will use eventually, uh, we can also work with that. Uh, so, but you know, it's 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 sensitive so just you know ping me and and uh, we'll understand uh, what what can we do um moshe do we develop in cuda directly or utilize tensorflow or such frameworks what do you say so for deep learning for neural networks it's uh, obviously much more efficient to use frameworks such as tensorflow uh, sometimes with keras or keras tensorflow on top of that or uh, darknet sometimes or other uh, uh, neural network frameworks mm -hmm. Uh, no reason to write a neural network in uh, CUDA. Uh, we also know uh, uh, some of our programmers are, are CUDA coders and uh, can write uh, uh, program, uh, write code in CUDA as well. And we do that when you know there's some specific uh, mathematical operation we need for the algorithm. We need to port it to a GPU, uh, some uh, 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 custom uh, uh, operation that's not in the standard libraries or that's uh, not a part of a neural network, but a, a part of a different uh, part of the algorithm. So we have that capability as well. Um, but it's it's not the first thing you would do in your three month PLC. Let's say. Yeah, I understand. Okay, we're pretty much uh, hitting the the end of the session. Um, last question: uh, Do you provide raw raw code? What are the intellectual property considerations? Uh, well, I can say it this way: Basically, uh, you have the IP. Okay, we provide it to the customer and the customer can use it however they want. Uh, there is no further billing along the way with, with regards to IP or royalties or anything like that. Uh, the only thing that you can't do is uh, sell it as such to other people. So, you know, it's not like we've provided you with something and then you sell that something. Uh, we provide you with something, you implement it into your uh, products and then you can sell as many as you want. Uh, that's completely uh, up to you. Uh, the only thing you can't do is sell our AI solution as a standalone uh, uh, and compete with us. That's uh, that's the only limitation. Uh, okay, I think we've reached uh, the mark. Uh, so I'll just uh, thank you all uh, very much for attending and for your uh, attentiveness and the uh, questions. If you do have another question, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, we're happy to talk about whatever you want, uh, you know, you're not wasting our time, just, uh, you know, pick up the phone, drop us an email, and uh, we'll be happy to answer and help in any way. Uh, and uh, stay tuned for our next webinars, okay? Uh, we will provide you with more and more webinars as the, the months uh, go by. Uh, actually, this is a good opportunity to say that uh, next week we will have a pharma webinar uh, regarding using AI in, in clinical trials. So you're welcome to uh, join it as well. Uh, and just uh, really stay tuned, uh, follow us on LinkedIn, uh, have a look at our website, uh, just uh, be in touch and uh, and we'll see you next time thank you very much moshe thank you very much everybody thank you